Hello, 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 hello. Now it's on. All right. Good evening. Good to have y'all. And uh, uh, good to be able to, to host uh, this week for the Family Summer Series. I know I uh, had a good, grou a good group last week, but I know uh, talking to some of the some of the individuals there that I know several are down in Brady at camp this week. Um, and so, uh, well, I don't know, is this, this is the junior session, so they would have been coming home today, but might not have been able to make it in time. But uh, we are so thankful that y'all are here. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, a period of worship uh, right now. We are going to... Our theme this summer is I Believe. Last week we had a lesson about why I believe in creation. Uh, this week, uh, Scout Betts from Lovkin, Texas, he preaches in Lovkin, Texas, and he is going to bring a lesson on our topic that of I Believe in the Bible. And so some foundational lessons that we're, are going to be covered this, this summer, and so I hope that you're looking forward to and planning to uh, to catch every one of those that you can. Again, we're thankful that you're here. And uh, to begin tonight, we are going to be singing, uh, I will call upon the Lord, which if, if you prefer to follow along in the book, will be number 32, but they will also be displayed on the screen tonight. Number 32, I will call upon the Lord. I will call upon the slides before this um, but that's my fault our next song will be number 650 listen to our hearts 650 listen to our hearts and following this song will be led in our first prayer by uh, Caleb Griffith How do you explain? Oh. 
Let's pray. Oh God, our great Father, we thank you so much for this evening that you have given to us, that we can gather together and praise your name, spend time in fellowship with one another, and study of the great truths that you have given to us. We thank you, Father, for the privilege of being your people, for having opportunities such as this to come into your presence. We thank you, Father, for your grace and your mercy. Lord, at this time, we are mindful of all those who have made the decision to be here. We thank you, Father, for hearts that we can join together with in fellowship, for the encouragement that we provide to each other. And we pray, Father, that in this earth we would grow together to become more like Jesus, to become closer together, and, Father, that one day we can all go home to be with you. Lord, we pray that as we study this evening, that our minds and our hearts would be open and attentive that we would listen to the message that has been prepared for us. We thank you, Father, for your word, for the truth that is found in it, for the trustworthiness and integrity that it has. We pray, Father, that we would be reminded tonight of how great the gift that you have given to us is. We know, Father, that you have given us all things that we need for life and for godliness. Father, we praise you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Our next song will be number 249 in the book, Firm Foundation. <clears throat> Jesus, you're my firm foundation. Oh, I can stand still. 
song before the lesson this evening will be number 72 blessed be your name and uh, it's easier to follow along on the slides if you're looking at the book this is one of those where it's like, you go back you go back you do all that sort of stuff but uh, just a reminder, but for those of you who have sung this song before, just a reminder that when, when, we, uh, when we get to the bridge, which is the you give and take away part, you'll see it on the screen, but uh, the bases stay out the first time through, then come back through, add the bases, and, uh, and then we do the test camp part where the, uh, the ladies will, will do the verses while the guys and me uh, sing the, sing the uh, give and take away part. So if you know where your part is, just follow that. If you don't know where your part is, follow the person next to you. Blessed be your name.
following along in the book will be number 614 humble yourself brother scout well good evening thankful to be with you this evening um, we traveled from east texas this morning hoping to get away from the heat and it's still hot but it's a little more humid in east texas so y'all y'all have us beat on the the dryness and so we're thankful to get a little break from that humidity uh, thankful to be here this evening. Uh, there's, I think there was a little bit of bias in me with my father-in-law being the preacher here. I'm not sure. Maybe a little bit, but we are grateful to be here. Uh, looking forward to opening up God's Word with you this evening. We're looking at, I believe in the Bible. And I certainly do. I believe in the Bible. We all believe in something, don't we? Some things that we believe in, we believe stronger. Others are very loose in, in how we believe and what we believe. And our goal this evening is not necessarily going to be to, to sway us to believe the Bible, because I would say that the majority of us here do already believe that it is God's Word. However, if there is someone here who does not believe, we're hoping that this evening we're going to be able to look at proofs that strengthen and bolster the fact that the Bible is not only God's Word, but it is believable for all of us. There is something about the pages that we turn in a physical Bible that give us comfort. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of, of electronic Bibles. They have their place. But if you have your physical Bible here, turn there right there this evening to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15 as we begin. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse number 15, a verse that is going to be very familiar to many looking at the idea that we are to give a defense for the truth that is found therein, that we are able to uh, be ready to give a defense for everyone who asks us a reason for what lies within the text. Now, we're not going to spend the entirety of this evening looking only at the Bible, because what we want to give ourselves is some ammunition, if you will, to go out and present it to people who don't believe in the Bible. Because if they don't believe in the Bible, they're not going to sit down and have a Bible study with you right away. We're going to look at a number of historical and archaeological discoveries that are going to strengthen the case for the Bible being absolutely true, being 100% accurate. When we hear of something being true, our desire should be to test it. I, I want someone to prove to me that what you said is true. Because without the testing, without the verifying, without evidence, whatever it is you're telling me to believe in, it's not going to hold any water, in my opinion, until it's proven to do so. I, I could tell you right now that the sky is purple, but you wouldn't believe me, and rightfully so. You saw the sky before you walked in here. I could stand before you this evening and tell you that I hold a Bachelor's of Science in Petroleum Geology, and unless you know me uh, more than just my name and that I'm the visiting preacher this evening, you would have to ask me a few questions to know if that is true or not. I don't hold a Bachelor's in Petroleum Geology, I'll give you that. 
But you would have to, to discuss with me for a moment, is this actually true? Did, did he go to school? Where did he go to school? What were the things that he studied in school? Do you see the picture there? You want to prove what is being said. This evening, again, we want to make sure that we understand that I believe in the Bible. But we want to test the Bible. And folks, the Bible is open for criticism. It welcomes it. It stands the test of time and always will. The Bible we're looking at is authored by roughly 40 different writers. Now, the Holy Spirit is going to be the ultimate author there. But these men each had a hand in writing or pinning these inspired words. These manuscripts that we're going to look at momentarily. These authors are going to write over the span of about 1,500 to 1,600 years, but the message is never going to change. That is something unheard of across any other literature ever been made, or ever been made known to man. That's an amazing factor in itself. When we look at the Bible having 40 authors, if we were to take 40 people in this room right now, and divvy them up into different rooms with no other qualifiers except you go into a room and you write me a story, and then in, in an hour we're going to come and get you, and when you come back out we're going to put them together. Are those stories going to match? They're not. There's going to be contradictions in them. They're not even going to know what the other person wrote about. So when you look at the idea there are 40 authors across such a time span, and yet the words are exactly the same and the message is going to be clear throughout it, it it's unheard of. It's unique. Their stories are going to be precise. They're going to be the same message through and through. And the same message that they're presenting is that Jesus is the Savior. He's the one that is coming. It's incredible to think about. But what's even more incredible is that these men were of various backgrounds. They were fishermen. They were statesmen. They were priests and prophets. They were farmers. They were kings. They were prisoners. They wrote in Hebrew, in Greek, in Aramaic. Some of them, they're going to write from the comfort of the palace. You think of King Solomon as he's there. Some of them are going to write from the confines of prison. We think of Paul and his letters to the churches. The different literature, the different styles of writing that are going to be presented, uh, they're, they're vast. We have law, we have poetry, we have uh, biographies, we have apocalyptic literature. They're each going to point towards the same message, and they're all going to play a part in God's Word. These men were from different continents, different, literally different time uh, uh, from one another. But the message is always the same. That's going to be repeated throughout this lesson. If there were one word we're going to use to describe the Bible this evening, it would be that word unique. It's unique in the way that it is put together. Now, when we think back to the time of Abraham, we think to Abraham and his journey throughout the Fertile Crescent. He is up on the northeast side of the, the Ur of the Chaldees, and he's going to, to travel down this Fertile Crescent all the way down to Egypt. But he is... He is Coming from a land of Ur, the Mesopotamia area was booming in, in maths and science and writings. They were, they were forming dictionaries from their writings there. It would make sense for such writings to come out of these places, these, these advanced civilizations, Ur, Egypt. We come to Rome as we're going to see some of these writings are going to take place there. But let's think about this. What kind of cultures did they come from they were very different weren't they they were different cultures there were different ethnicities the diversity between the regions is going to be great and therefore that's going to do nothing but bolster the fact that the bible is god's inspired word when we look at these these men who wrote these 40 men uh they were the original uh copiers if you will and they're going to, to present the, these messages out there. We have today roughly 25,000 manuscripts that have been found. That's so far. They're still, they're still going to continue to dig, and they're going to find more, I believe. 
Some of these, of these uh, manuscripts, they are in full. Some of them are in fragments. And yet each one of them, no matter where they find them or how old they may be, the message is still the same. When we look at other pieces of literature, uh, they don't even hold a candle to the Bible in regards to things like this. We're going to look at, at, at a few authors here. We think about Pliny, and we're going to look at, at their original date of writing, and then we're going to look at their original or their first copies. And make sure we pay attention to the length of time between the original and the copy. And then when we get to the Bible, we're really going to drive that home. But Pliny, Pliny the Younger, the original date that he is writing uh, his documents is somewhere around A.D. 61 through 113, somewhere in there. We don't know the exact dates. But the earliest copy of this man's writings are going to be A.D. 850. That is 750 years time difference from the original to the copy. We look at Plato, the philosopher, uh, somewhere between 427 and, and uh, 347 B.C. The earliest copy is going to be A.D. 900. We're looking at 1,200 years between the original and the copy. We think about Aristotle. Aristotle and his writings, somewhere between 384 and 322 B.C., and the earliest copy is going to be A.D. 1100. That's 1,400 years from the original to the first copy. The, the one that's going to come the closest but still doesn't hold a candle to the Bible is Homer's Iliad. You've heard of it, have you not? And it, it is somewhere around 900 B.C. is when this writing is going to take place. And the earliest copy of Homer's Iliad is about 400 B.C. 500 years between the original and the copy. So that is significantly smaller than the others we're looking at. That's the closest one, though, you're going to get to the Bible. So let's look at the Bible now and its, its original and its copies. The New Testament was written about A.D. 50 to 100, in that time frame. And the earliest copy was A.D. 130. Did you catch that? You're still within, you're less than 100 years between the original and the copy. We're looking at, at these people who perhaps were, were hearing, or they were hearing, excuse me, not tearing, hearing from the individuals who actually penned these books. It, 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 quite possibly, if not, it was just the second generation. You're looking at 30 to 75 to maybe 100 years between the originals and the copies of the Bible. And another, it's just another fact that's going to help us bolster the Bible. There are about 5,700 manuscripts found to date for the Bible here. New Testament. 5,700. 5,700. Now you're looking at we look at Homer's Iliad, there are 643 of his original manuscripts found. There are 49 for Aristotle. There are seven for Plato. There are seven for Pliny the Younger. They are thousands, literally thousands off from even coming close to the Bible and the amount of manuscripts that we find. So what's the correlation, though? What's the correlation between time and copies? The longer the time, the more room there is for error. Discrepancies, holes in the plot. The message is going to change over that time, but not for the Bible. These people penned it and they copied it very quickly. That is part of God's plan there. Another uh, amazing fact pertaining to the Bible is this. There have never been, nor will there ever be, any historical or archaeological discoveries that do anything but verify what is found in Scripture. Never. And it's going to do nothing but continue to, to build up the trustworthiness of the Bible. With that thought in mind, we want to examine a few archaeological finds this evening. Uh, turn with your Bibles, turn in your Bibles with me, excuse me, to Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. Looking at verses 17 through 21, and we're not going to read the entirety of that, but Genesis chapter 15, verses 17 through 21, there is going to be a, na a nation mentioned there called the Hittites. 
Genesis chapter 15, verses 17 through 21, you're going to see the Hittites mentioned. You're going to see it in, in Joshua chapter 11, verse number 3. Uh, if my memory is serving correctly right now, I believe there's about 40 other uh, verses in Scripture that are going to mention the name of the nation of the Hittites. Now, critics for years, years, are going to claim that the nation of the Hittites was not actually real, that it was some made-up thing in the Bible to make the story sound better, to, to, uh, to give a different background or, or twist the words that they're going to say. But in 1906, a man by the name of Hugo Winkler, a German archaeologist, he was excavating an area in which we know now is modern-day Turkey. And in this, this archaeological dig that he's going through, he's going to find tablets. But not just a few. In, we're not talking electronic tablets here, kids. We're talking clay tablets. Clay tablets, but not just a few of them. 10,000 clay tablets. And you know what's on those clay tablets? What is contained in those clay tablets is an extensive detail of the Hittite nation. Enough information that, that this man was able to reconstruct the history of the Hittite nation. The nation that critics claimed for so many years didn't exist. Now, that discovery verifies just what the Bible says, doesn't it? Archaeology is fascinating to me. There's another man by the name of Sir William Ramsey. He was a Scottish archaeologist. He was a professor. He was an atheist. And he was a, a Bible skeptic. Now, keep that in mind. He believed that the Bible was made up of, of good stories, uh, really blown out of proportion things uh, to sway people's opinions. So that way we would hear a good story and we want to believe it because it just is a good story. Friends, this isn't just a good story. It's the greatest story that's ever been. It's not just good literature, but that is what this man, Sir William Ramsey, is thinking. He's going to set out to prove that the book of Acts was uh, not correct in its historical standing. Really, he set out, he wanted to prove that Luke was a, a sloppy historian. Dr. Luke, remember? He was very concerned with the details. But he is trying to prove that, that Luke was a sloppy historian. We want to mention this again. We mentioned in the introduction, but the Bible is open for criticism. It can take it. Because the more people criticize it, the more it's going to verify itself. Sir Ramsey is, is looking to disprove Luke in the way that he can with geographical finds, with locations, with names of individuals, with authorities that he's going to look into. Fifteen years this man is going to spend studying to try to disprove the book of Acts. He's retracing uh, steps, if you will. He's retracing places that are mentioned, finding out where they are. He's looking intently at the names of of the authorities mentioned in his conclusion after a long 15 years you know what it was that Luke was a fantastic historian very accurate uh, he even says that he was one of the most trustworthy historians in all of antiquity all of ancient all of the ancient world this man who was an atheist shook the world to uh, I don't want to say to its core it's just one man he shook the world though when uh, he said that he's going to convert to Christianity because not only did his digging to try to disprove Luke prove to him that Luke was a great historian, that if Luke is accurate, the rest of the Bible is going to be accurate. Or excuse me, if Acts is accurate, the rest of the Bible is going to be accurate. This man converted because of his lifelong study to try to disprove the Bible. The Bible is fantastic. The evidence that, that he is uh, going to to uncover demanded a verdict. And that verdict was that it was historically accurate. The Smithsonian Institute. Have any of you ever been to the Smithsonian Institute? No one? I'm the only one? Okay, there we go. A few people have been to the Smithsonian Institute. It's, it's a wonderful museum to go to. It's the world's largest, at least that's what they're claiming, a museum of education and research complex. And on their website, they're going to have this to say about the Bible. Much of the Bible, particularly the historical, doc, or the historical documents in the Old Testament, they are as accurate of documents of any that they have from antiquity. And are in fact more accurate, this is still the quote, 
than many of the Egyptians, the Mesopotamians, and the Greek histories. It's more accurate. The history of the Bible is used to help dig sites when they're looking for where to dig for archaeological uh, discoveries. They're going to begin to, to see, okay, this is where this, uh, this town is located or should be located. And they begin to dig and they're going to find exactly what the Bible is going to proclaim. There is a, a piece of stone that was uncovered in, in 1961 in an archaeological dig in Caesarea. There was a Latin inscription on it. And on that stone it read Pontius Pilatus perfect, or Prefect excuse me, of Judea. Well, this isn't news to the Bible reader, is it? We know that, that Pontius Pilate was, was the one there when Jesus was going to be crucified. We look at John chapter 18, verse number 29. But this is certainly going to take another thing away from Bible skeptics, isn't it? They're, they're going to claim that, that, or that Pilate was not actually a, a real man, that he wasn't a, a real character. There are some more interesting finds in Jerusalem. There is one. Turn with me in your Bibles to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 32. 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse number 30. Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse number 30. This same Hezekiah also stopped the water outlet of the upper Gihon, and he brought the water by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all his works. That tunnel has actually been discovered. You can walk through it. Uh, if you want to take the time, some of this information that, that I, I'm uh, regurgitating here is from, from the Apologetics Press. I hope you visit that site. It is a wealth of information there. But there is a video of them from the men who work at Apologetics Press or with Apologetics Press. They are literally walking through Hezekiah's tunnel. But they had to look to Scripture. They're not the original finders of it, obviously. But they looked to Scripture so long ago, and they found this tunnel exactly how it said it routed the water that Hezekiah did so long ago. There is a... Uh, a fragment called the Taylor Prism. A man named Robert Taylor in 1830 discovered about a 15-inch tall clay cylinder. The text found on that prism was written by the king of Assyria, Sennacherib. And there is a, a portion of the text that reads this. As to Hezekiah the Jew, he did not submit to my yoke. I laid siege to 46 of his strong cities his walled forts, and to the countless small villages in their vicinity, and conquered them all by means of well-stamped earth ramps and battering rams. Now, this alone adds value to Scripture because it mentions Hezekiah by name and what he's doing to the cities that Hezekiah is, is over. But the Bible has something to say about Sennacherib, doesn't it? Let's look, at, we're still in Second Chronicles. Let's look at Second Chronicles chapter 32, looking at verse number 1. 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse number 1. After these deeds of faithfulness, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came and entered Judah. He encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them over to himself. That is exactly, the, it's, it's just a different perspective. Sennacherib is giving this on this clay cylinder that has been found. But the Bible is, is going to give us the same information way before that is ever found. One of the most impressive, at least in my opinion, uh, finds is what they call the Cyrus Cylinder. You ever heard of it? The Cyrus Cylinder. In 1879, a small clay cylinder, it's now in the British Museum, uh, commissioned by King Cyrus. It wasn't necessarily him that wrote on it, but he was, he was the one t saying the words be written on it. And the inscription reads, I returned to the sacred cities on the other side of the Tigris, the sanctuaries of which had been in ruins for a long time, the images which used to live there and, and establish for them permanent sanctuaries. Look at me, look with me for a moment to the book of Ezra. The book of Ezra. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 11. Again, we're not going to read this, but I want to, to get you to where we're going. Uh, verses 1 through 4 it says that Cyrus 
is, remember, this is a prophecy. Cyrus is going to send the Jews back uh, from exile. He's going to build a house in Jerusalem. He's going to fulfill that prophecy from the prophet Jeremiah. The Cyrus cylinder is a very interesting thing to look at. All of these finds, and there are more, certainly there are more. Are they hurting the Bible and its accuracy? Or are they validating it? Are they doing nothing but bolstering the fact that, that God's word is true? We look at the foreknowledge of God in the scriptures. Uh, really, we're going to look at specifically as we begin to, to draw to an end, the scientific foreknowledge. Be, turning your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 17, verse number 12. Genesis chapter 17, verse number 12. Now, what's interesting is, is these words were penned hundreds, if not thousands of years before men would even discover the things that are being spoken of here in the text. Genesis chapter 17, verse number 12. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male child in your generations, he who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. So why the eighth day? Was it a, a lucky guess? Why not right when they're born? Nobody had any idea scientifically, medically, until the 1900s. It's a long time removed. You're looking at close to uh, 3,500 years with the book of Genesis being written. The medical research is going to gain more advancements there in the 1900s, and they're going to discover that on the eighth day, it's the best day to perform that surgery. Vitamin K is very low in children when they're, when they're first born. That's why you need a, a vitamin K shot when you're first born. But specifically for the males, uh, when you're looking at the eighth day, that vitamin K is going to go up above 100%. It's somewhere around 110, 120%. Probably the highest it's going to be in your lifetime. Do you know what vitamin K does? It helps with the clotting of blood. But only on the eighth day is it that high. How's it known? God's going to be the one that the Holy Spirit is the one that's, that is inspiring these men to write what they're going to write. No way Moses figured that out on his own. He's not going to take a, a, a test subject and say, we're going to try it one day, one, two, three. No, the eighth day is what God told him to do. And that's what they did. And that's what they did for centuries, almost a millennia. Until the 1900s when they figured out why. We look at, at Jonah chapter 2, verse number 6. It says that he goes down, or he's in the belly of the, of the, of the fish, and he says, I went down to the moorings of the mountains. He's describing there for us ocean topography. Now, for, for the longest time, most people thought that the ocean floor looked like the beach. It was sandy and flat all the way through. But there are mountains on the ocean floor. I heard a funny thought on a podcast I was listening to, and it said uh, something along the lines of, Jonah didn't go out and free dive down to the bottom of the ocean. No, he, he, he knew what to write because God inspired him to write it. But that ocean topography was not discovered for thousands of years because until scuba gear came along, until submarines came along, we weren't able to get down that far in the ocean. God's scientific foreknowledge is seen once again. There was a man named uh, Matthew Maury. After reading Psalm 8, verse number 8, it says, The birds of the air and the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. And the text is going to continue there. That man, after reading Psalm 8, verse number 8, he says, Well, it's in the Bible. I'm going to go find those paths of the sea because if God's going to say it, I'm going to go out there and find it. They must be there. He seeks to find them, and you know what? He did find them, and they became the major trade routes for sea travel. They still are to this day, the paths of the sea. We look at the book of Leviticus, and sometimes we skip over the book of Leviticus. It, it, it seems mundane at times. It, it's just a bunch of rules and laws, but, but when you really dig into Leviticus, it's, it's a fantastic book. I love Leviticus chapter 17, verse number 11. Uh, life is in the blood. Now that's going to be, we can, we can expand on that to looking at, at Christ Jesus eventually, but that's not our topic for this evening. That's just the preacher starting to talk. We look at Leviticus chapter 11. Turn with me there in your Bibles. 
Leviticus chapter 11, verses 9 through 12, roughly. And again, we're not going to read it. But the summation is the things that are in the water. Remember, let's back up just a bit. He is he's describing to them the things you can eat that are clean and that are unclean. But specifically here in this context, chapter 11, verses 9 through 12, he's looking at the things that are in the water. The things that are in the water that you can eat must have scales and fins. Scales and fins. They have to fit both of those criteria. If it does only one, it's out. Don't eat it. Now, these dietary restrictions, as we continue to learn, they were for their benefit, were they not? Uh, when you look at the idea that they're cutting out pork, pork, if undercooked, is, is very dangerous to the human body. But specifically here in the water, those animals that they are not to eat, you think about it today, uh, lionfish, poisonous, pufferfish, poisonous, uh, a boxfish is poisonous, eels, their blood is poisonous, and they don't meet those qualifications, do they? They either have fins or they have scales, or they don't have both. And if they're missing them, you, can't, you cannot eat them. Trial and error? I, I doubt it. Hey, we're going to see. It, it could have been. They could have eaten a puffer fish and said, that's not it. We're going to go to the next one. No, it, it was the foreknowledge of God. Maybe you know someone who is a skeptic of the Bible. Perhaps you're a skeptic of the Bible. Maybe it is that you don't fully believe that the Bible is God's word. Have any of these items presented to you this evening piqued your interest? Would you like to know more? For those of us who already believe the Bible is the word of God, and is any of this new to you? Are these things that are beneficial for us to go out and spread the gospel to others? We look at 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, the New King James Version is going to read, Be diligent to present yourselves approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The King James is going to read, Study to show thyself approved. Now, this is what we need to understand who God is. But as we are studying this, as we are expounding upon these things, as we're taking the, the things that are found in the text, when we start doing the historical backgrounds and the archaeological backgrounds, and we are able to, to put them side by side, that strengthens the Bible. We can share that with others. Man, I don't have to yell anymore with that AC off. It strengthens the, the cause for the Bible. We could learn what we need right here to get to heaven from the Bible alone. It is more than sufficient. These proofs, these extra biblical evidences, they're not going to hurt the Bible. They bolster it. And I, I believe the Bible not because of these, of these evidences, but because of the truth that is found therein within the pages of Scripture. It backs it up every time. Do you know this evening the truth that's found within its pages? Have you obeyed that truth found within its pages? Do you want to know more about that truth? Do you want to expound upon those things? Can we help you in any way this evening? I believe in the Bible. I want you to believe in the Bible. God has sent his, his word for us so that we can believe in the Bible. Can we help you in any way this evening? Won't you let it be known as together we stand as we sing. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God.
be here tonight. Uh, I'm thankful for the, the wonderful singing that we've been able to be a part of, praising our God, encouraging one another, and then hearing the message about God's Word and about the Bible. And hopefully these are, uh, again, things that reinforce uh, what we believe, and if not, have given us uh, some things to think about and to reason through about why we should believe that the Bible is the Word of God. We're going to sing one more song and then have closing prayer by, by Brother, Brother Darren, Darren. And I would ask him to please mention uh, and be our thankfulness for the food, which, uh, which I want to let everybody know. If you will go through these doors up the ramp and into our multi-purpose room, um, we have hamburgers and, uh, and some fixings to go along with that and hope that you all have planned on staying to eat with us. But if not, please, if you're able to alter those plans, stay and eat with us. We are so thankful that you are here. Our last song is going to be number 116 in the book, Mighty to save, mighty to save, and then we will be led in our closing prayer and, uh, and give thanks for the food. <clears throat> Everyone needs compassion, love has never failed me, let the
pray together. Our Holy Father, we thank you that we have that hope of eternal salvation because we can look to your word and trust in every word that it says. Father, for the time to, together tonight to reflect on the trustworthiness of your word, we are so very thankful. We're thankful for your plan to save us. We're thankful for your plan for us to come together while we're on this earth as a church, as your people, the redeemed. Father, thank you for the church here at North Main. We pray your rich blessings upon it. We're thankful for what it stands for. We pray that you will be with every member here. We're so thankful for their hospitality and their fellowship tonight and just pray that you will continue to encourage us as brethren. We're thankful for each other. We're most thankful for your son that binds us together. Father, thank you for the food that we can share and that gracious hearts have prepared for us uh, to enjoy together tonight. And again, we thank you for all things through our Savior. Amen.